contact with the teacher, of course, when we teach something, it is a dominant language, it is a dominant um, curriculum, and it is determined by those by power. And as I said just now, it is perpetuating the status quo, and within schools itself, um, only particular knowledge is legitimized. And those, actually those who are not exclude, uh, included, will be unable to contribute to the process of this authentication process. So I think this is very important because um, for, for us Malay users, Malay language users, it is uh, not just being a passive, um, what do you call that, passive recipient, but you have to actually be more dynamic contributors and try to question whatever is being taught. Because I think that is the beauty of education, to question the system that educated you. And also, um, this is quite a recent uh, paper, I think, because most of the critical literacy paper that I saw were written in the 80s um, and also the 70s, but those in post-2000 uh, were really not much of my interest. But this and back, um, she actually said that critical education theory of critical literacy applies the tenet of critical social theory to the educational arena and takes on the task of examining how schools reproduce inequality and justice. So perhaps um, the word inequality is not really dominant in our daily um, dealings with schools, but inequality in our personal lives. So that would be um, very much um, interesting for us to explore. Um, the main interest for me was uh, when I read this book, Pedagogy of the Press by Fred, and he actually mentioned that um, how it's developed in the educational context. And his work actually draws from Karl Marx, a classical view of ideology, that a ruling class ideology will dominate what counts as school knowledge and ideology. So, which means literacy is an expression of dominant ideology, of passive transmission, and reproduction of dominant, distorted views of the world. It sounds quite morbid actually, but I would feel that he's trying to say that Whatever we know, whatever we learn, is actually predetermined and pre-chosen by someone else. So what is it for us then, you see? So, and again, um, Fred actually proposes a system in which students become more socially aware through the critic of multiple forms of injustice, and this awareness cannot be achieved if students are not given the opportunity to explore and construct knowledge. So how many of you here are students? Because I know most of them are students, yes, all of us I think by right are students still. We are usually receiving knowledge and receiving uh, things that we learn every day from someone who is um, smarter or better. So when are we given the chance to explore and when are we given the chance to construct? Almost none, right? So perhaps, not today, not tomorrow, perhaps in the next years to come, Malay language will be able to be more dynamic and uh, everyone will have something to construct. That's um, utopian. <laughs> okay, so this is quite interesting. Anyone who wants to talk about critical literacy, I'm not an expert, but I think it's something that I have a strong passion towards. And he always describes education as a banking concept. Okay, I think Singapore being a banking hub, we will know this too well. And what Fred said was that we are now schools are like um, institutions where we turn students into containers, into receptacles to be filled by the teacher. Which means when you come to school, right, you are empty. You do not know what's going on and you just say, okay, um, fill me with knowledge. So that is what he meant by you are just containers. And in such classroom, the knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider to know nothing. So I think again, it's um, really interesting. Uh, as a teacher myself, I do not know sometimes whether I am smart or I am enough to bestow enough knowledge to my students. Because I do not definitely think my students are empty, uh, empty containers or empty receptacles. Because when you come to class, I'm sure you have pre-existing knowledge of the language and the culture. So who am I? Who, am I? who is a teacher to actually say, I will fill you with knowledge? So this banking concept is what Fred opposes, and he said it's called funds of knowledge, which is again problematic. So again, um, he opposes it, of course, and um, educators who recognize the possible value of developing critical theory, or critical literacy, sorry, you should not view your students as vessels to be filled. And as um, teachers, like for myself and Anna and also my fellow friends here, we do not believe that students are just uh, passive learners and they're supposed to create opportunities for themselves to construct new knowledge. And schools ideally should become spaces where students interrogate social conditions through dialogues. And again, this is idealistic and we try our best in schools to do that, but I would think it's a challenge. Um, and also, educators who engage in literacy, critical literacy serve less than instructors and more as facilitators. And later on, when I do my uh, critique with response to Sukata Pelajaran Bahasa Melayu, Sekolah Menengah 2011, because I'm a Malay teacher, so this was my pre, sorry, my primary resource for comparative. And um, I believe Fred actually affirms that knowledge
phonics, um, emerges phonics invention and reinvention through the restless, I think we are, impatient, very, continuing, hopeful, inquiring human beings, pursuing the world, with the world and with each other. So I think this is a beautiful conclusion that he said, and I think we all have to be that. We have to invent, reinvent, be restless, be impatient, continue to be hopeful, and just inquire ourselves and each other every day. Okay, next one in my paper, I covered about critical literacy in practice. There's no point of us just talking about theory day in, day out. How do we actually um, try to apply it to our daily classrooms and not perhaps wait for the high authorities to give uh, instruction? Because sometimes, as we know, directives from the top will take some time. And as teachers ourselves, we have to be empowered to know how do we apply such theories into practice. Um, okay, for this case, um, we should encourage students to question disparities within social contexts such as social and economic status, race, class and gender. Teachers do that, I'm sure, but we have to be consciously doing it, not just subconsciously or when the chance, uh, when the opportunity rises. Yes, we done consciously. And becoming critically literate will require students to master the ability to read and critique messages in text in order to better understand whose version of knowledge is being privileged. By being privileged here, I mean uh, there's no wrong or right, but whose is perhaps the which uh, opinion is more legitimate than the other. So we have to question that. And noble dementia, these are also two very um, important uh, academics who actually study a lot about critical literacy. They suggested that students, when they become critically literate, they can examine ongoing development, the parts they play in the world, and how they make sense of experiences. And I think this is really beautiful, because in class, nothing is cast in stone. Because we have 40 students in class, and everyone has a different experience. And the learning of the Malay language it has to be like that because it is owned by the people and it is not owned by the curriculum or the teachers themselves. So they have to play a part in the development. Am I going too fast? Okay. Is that five for me? I'm going too fast? Okay, I will slow down. Because it's patient. Because in school we have only 45 minutes to cover a few things, so I'm used to it. Okay, so again. Um, when I talk about critical literacy in practice, right? Um, I did this already, right? Um, there's this, this table actually helps us to summarize and better understand what Frere meant by reading the world, sorry, reading the word and reading the world. So I kind of simplify it. Uh, reading the word to me is basically just to decode and encode. It is literal. It's literal. And to bring ourselves to the pages, which means whatever is in the pages, that is it. There's no plus minus, it's just like that. And to make meaning of those pages as they relate to experiences, possibilities, cultures, and knowledge. So that is just reading the word. It is, uh, I would say, reading level one. And then, reading the world is to decode and encode the people and community around us. Which means, I think, when we pursue a certain text, we have to understand when was it written, who wrote it, who was the intended audience, and perhaps the author themselves do not know what would be the implication of their work 10 or 20 years to come. Okay, so that was what I understand by the people and community around us. And also, this is quite interesting, the visible and invisible messages. So that is again, I think, a challenge for all of us here because when we talk about Malay language, it is something that has become so technical. And when we teach in school, it is really about grammar, in Bohan. Uh, you shouldn't write a place. Your sentence is, uh, is not, uh, what do you call that, is, is not structural, so it's not technical. And that is the unfortunate state it is now. And so I think, the, inv the invisible has become almost more invisible and the visible is slowly becoming invisible. So I would think that structural um, approach towards language is uh, a concern for me. Okay, and then, um, because this is basically just my theory uh, exploration, we have not gotten to the fun part of uh, exploring, okay? Um, I would say that um, facilitating the development of critical literacy promotes the examination and reforms of social situations and we actually expose students to the biasness and the hidden agenda as written text. And this cannot be denied. For example, if you look at school textbooks, right, um, I think about 20 years ago, it will be actually very different from school textbooks that you have now. For example, um, in our research, we have also found that, for example, 20 years ago in a textbook, a Malay man would have been um, conveniently labeled as perhaps a driver or a gardener. And it's a fact. It is not something that should be hidden. It is a fact. And whereas um, the counterparts from another race would be perhaps a doctor, a teacher, or uh, someone else. So you, you would not see, for example, a Chinese 
portrayal, it will be as a driver or a gardener. It might have, but in my research I did not see it. So that is against the biases and hidden agendas, which is not wrong because sometimes it is factual because we do have a lot of Malays who are drivers and gardeners, but we also have Malays who are doctors and engineers. So that is again what we mean by teaching students to question the hidden agendas and biases in what you mean. So in this sense, uh, when I say critically literate, I'm talking so slowly that I'm falling asleep because I'm a, I'm a debater from JC, so I'm trained to speak very quickly, but yes, I will try my best to speak slowly. When we say that we are critically literate, what we mean is that we are trying to read in a reflective manner. And when I say read, and I think also all of us here, we know that read is not just a verb per se. It is actually to understand the meaning of the messages, and instead of just looking at the words on the page, we have to understand the meaning behind the words. And it's easier said than done, because even for me as a teacher now, it is sometimes very challenging to try to find time to decode a message and try to explain it because of uh, certain challenges such as first um, time and secondly examinations because I think examinations is very important but it actually hinders a lot of development in terms of creating new knowledge and creating new possibilities of discussion or dialogues. Okay, and also another academics and most of these academics, all the case studies that they use were based in the US and they were actually using it more on the minorities, which means when I read, they did um, uh, action uh, research with um, students from the minority, the blacks, and also in Australia, the Aboriginal children. And it's very interesting that they would say that language itself has a power. And what is the power of this language? Because I believe that language is, has a lot of potential as well to be a tool for people to analyze the division of power and resources in their own society and transform discriminatory structures. So this might sound a little bit complex, but I will try to simplify it by saying perhaps language has the power to change, which means the way you write, the way you speak will actually influence the way you think and also the way that you question things. So I would strongly suggest that teachers will take more time in reading because sometimes we allow students to, okay, just quickly read through and sometimes a lot of important things get missed just by reading like that. So, and when students learn to use the tools for critical literacy, they get exposed discuss and attempt to solve the social injustice within their own lives. So sometimes, as I said, we're not trying to solve injustice in a global or an international scale, but more towards their own personal life. Because prayer was all about empowering the people, empowering the minority, empowering those who are marginalized. So again, I do not say that Malay language is marginalized, but I would say that Malay language is at a point of concern for us to start rethinking the way we learn it and the way we teach it. Alright, so now I, after going through the theory and also the introduction part, um, I would like to look at critical literacy in the Malay language classroom. Um, I was approached by um, Quan, who actually kindly told me that what is the scope of my discussion today. And I told her that um, as a secondary school teacher, of course, I naturally um, focus more towards secondary school syllabus and what I went through and based on what I know. But recently, there have been a lot of debate and discussion about preschool. Right? The director from MOE has been saying that preschool has also been part of MOE and I would think that critical literacy would then have to start from preschool and that would be a possibly possible uh, exploration for further studies or people who are interested in the subject because I think in preschool when we talk about Malay language uh, in preschool there's not much discussion that we know of there's not much academic papers or academic research that's been done and I think that would be very interesting to know that how do we try to imbue critical literacy from from young or from preschool level. Um, okay, so in the Malay classroom, I will use, uh, I think as many teachers would also do, novels, magazine articles, short films, and the important thing is that we have to approach it through a lens that challenges societal norms, which means I would think that it would be very unfortunate to have a teacher who would teach as what is on the paper, which means what is it, what is there is there, which means beyond that, let's not discuss it. So I think no teachers are like that, I hope. So we can actually, start to um, challenge our students to evaluate whose knowledge is being privileged and deconstruct the message of those meanings. So for example, I will use uh, two poems today uh, and we'll try to try and deconstruct it and see how it actually aligns with um, the 2011 curriculum. And we will try to see whether we are going in the right direction or there's actually more to be done. And as readers, uh, students should also evaluate the social constructions of text and question the factors that may influence the author. Alright, um, we, okay, it's the same thing as just now. I'm trying to say that we have to ask our students to look at text beyond the perspective of what is on the paper and move and recreate. And I actually tried to use this four resources model and I will share with you the model. And this model is, um, I would say, it has never been um, applied for 
only language. I've seen it being applied for English, for other subjects, uh, for literature, but uh, for only language, I think we have not used it, so let's try and exploit it and see the possibility. <clears throat> okay, this four resources model was created by Look and Freebody in 1999, and they actually formulated this four resources model to help educators to how to create a viable framework to create resources. Because when you want to do critical literacy, the choice of text is very important. You cannot just choose text which is, um, you cannot just choose any text. It has to be meaningful text and they actually uh, gave this four uh, resources model to help us and I think it's really interesting. And this four model, the first one is code, coding practices, code breakers, which means this practice will require decode systems of written, spoken and visual images and it involves making sense of communication codes such as illustrations and stuff and to recognize um, the use of camera angles. This is really interesting. Excuse me. For example, when uh, we were to see a picture, because now for only language for secondary school, we are supposed to have oral um, with graphics with pictures. And sometimes when a picture is taken, you will question, why is the angle at the side? Why is this angle from the top? Or why is this picture taken? Uh, is it a candid shot? Is it a post shot? So, you know, it's a question. For example, like we had a picture about flooding. And a flooding picture can never be posted, right? Because the people in the picture will not be in the mood to post. And they will be really unhappy and, you know, they will be really um, bothered by what's going on. So we have to question, we have simple things like camera angles. And this is the first level, just breaking codes. Okay, the second part is to require to build and construct cultural meaning. So you can see, it builds up. Comprehending text and develop resources that question text, drawing on prior knowledge. And I think prior knowledge is really understated. Because when we come to school, we would appreciate that students be quiet and not question anything because it will make our lives easier. But fact is, each student who comes to class actually has a prior knowledge and this prior knowledge is something which has to be used and utilised by the teacher itself. And comparing own experiences, and this again I think is um, a real challenge because as I said, in a class of 40, it is difficult to draw on experiences of all different students. But we can try and making connections and inferences when comparing text and knowing how to predict. This is also a skill because for example, when we read something without going to the next page, you would know what's going to happen, especially for the labels. The, I mean like for Sastra Pichu's son. Like before turning, you will say, ah, the girl is going to leave him. And it's true, the girl left him. So, you know, it's predictable. And pre predictable is not bad, it's just sometimes it makes you uh, feel that there must be more to this text. So I would think that choosing resources is really important because you want your students to know how to predict, sequence and evaluate without getting bored or even worse, getting jaded by what they are doing. The third one, sorry, um, this is about the same thing, um, graphic, uh, symbols and textual information. The third one is, I would think, um, quite challenging, um, pragmatic practices, which means you would choose resources um, effectively in daily life looking at cultural and social functions. We are moving in that direction. We can see that in the examination papers, they are trying to find authentic materials and things like that. But is it still very authentic is the question because that will be something that I think all teachers are questioning whether all students will be able to understand and really comprehend what is being tested when they call it authentic materials. And also you have to recognize the purpose and the audience. There was one article that we saw in the Rita Haria. It was uh, selling uh, Jamu. Jamu is a traditional Malay medicine and the language they use, although it's in the, in, in the national papers, the language they use were really strange and my students were asking, what is this? What is this? And it gets uncomfortable for me to explain because as some of you might know, some Jamu are used for, you know, to help the man. So when students ask, what, what is this? What do you mean by this? So again, this is what we mean by when we want students to question, are the teachers ready to answer? So it is actually these pragmatic practices is a challenge because when students start to ask and then whether you can answer or the answer is it something which is uh, meaningful or it's just something that you just want to let them, okay, moving on. Alright, so appropriate text start is really important and particular purposes both inside and outside school. There was one year where we would test students on what was your experience of flying a plane or uh, being in a plane. So you can assume that all students have had the experience of taking a flight. So that is again the question of pragmatic practices where we test something or we use something in the name of critical literacy saying that ah this is pragmatic but again the personal experiences will have to count and you have to be more tactful about the choices of resources. And the last one is critical practices 
and this is high level, this is level 4, where your resource will actually be pursuing your students to analyze, critic and second guess facts. This is high level, so I would think that it is um, possible for perhaps JC or university level, but for secondary school level, I would think comfortably it will be level 2 and level 3 in terms of resources. So I am trying to... Uh, I don't think there's anyone for MOE here, right? No, I don't think so. So it's just trying to perhaps um, see the possibility of putting in critical literacy in our uh, curriculum because I think it is something that we want students to be, to be questioned, to be questioned, uh, to question what is being thought. Okay, um, back to the PowerPoint. Alright, so that was the four resources model that I was trying to, to apply. And looking at what has been said just now, the students have to understand that when we talk about critical literacy, it is exploration of language and literature in many forms of which power relationships found are never neutral. So no texts are ever neutral. So when we, when we read something, we have to invoke emotions. For example, for critical literacy, when I read the academic papers written by uh, scholars in the US, for each thing that was given, they would ask and ask and ask. And I would think that is a skill that educators have to have, which is to ask good questions. Not just who, what, why, how, when. That is, I think, quite structural. And beyond that, how do you question your students? And we would know that the text is not neutral. And again, upon doing my uh, research, I realized that there's no one fit all formula on how many language educators should engage students using critical literacy. Because for me, myself, I am still trying to find a way to engage students and question. But I guess for all different educators, it be a different thing. Okay, and also um, this scholar, Herman, he also said that it's an organic process, which means that it has to be revisited and refined. And uh, we have to analyze different perspective on a single event. And uh, how many of us are teachers? Or perhaps, okay, never mind. I would... We should invite more teachers. It's just me thinking a lot of this. Alright. Uh, when we talk about critical literacy, the questions have to be critical. It cannot be who, what, why, how only. So, for example, um, I use this model uh, saying that when you talk about textual purpose, because we cannot escape from textual purpose when we talk about literacy, we don't just ask uh, what is this text about, okay? And we have to question, how do you know that? What would be the most likely to read or who would like to most likely read or view this text and why? And why are we reading this in the first place? Uh, why does the, what does the author want us to know? Why? So, you know, these are questions which is actually difficult because if the students answer, it will take a long time and you have to actually engage them in a the dialogue. So, it's a challenge. And textual structure and features are the same. What is the structure and features of this text? What sort of genre is this? Uh, what does the title even suggest? So, you see, there's a lot of questioning. And what does the word suggest? For example, like when I said just now, in academic papers, like they didn't write the word question, they just wrote interrogate. So, it's a higher level. So it's uh, what does it suggest and what kind of language is used. For example, I will talk about uh, Tekat. Tekat is um, a newly published book uh, by MOE. It's actually a compilation of local works. It's really great. And students who take Malay literature will use this book. But it will, although my school do not offer Malay literature, we actually, I actually choose, selectively choose certain texts inside to be used in class. And I think that um, it's really good. One thing is a um, dialogue session for students and also it makes you appreciate local writers more. Okay. And construction of characters. How are children, teenagers, men, women, elderly constructed or portrayed in the text? Okay. How are characters constructed? What do the author represent and why? So these are questions that it is actually not easy for the teacher because you really, really have to ask. And the gaps and silences. Are there any gaps and silences in the text? Whose voices is missing? Who was left out? What was left out? And which issues was not raised? So these are questions which will evoke students to respond and this would be the ideal outcome of a critical literature person. Power and interest. In whose interest is the text? Is it beneficial for all? Is the text fair? Was it written fairly? Is it just? Uh, what knowledge does the reader need to bring in? For example, when you read something, if, you're not, if you do not have the prior knowledge, there's no way you can understand. If you ask me to read something about car engines, there's no way I can understand because there's no prior knowledge. So in terms of that, the teacher would have to say the selection of text is very important for critical literacy and whose views are excluded and who is allowed to speak and who was silenced. So all these are really important. And the same goes for uh, whose view, whose reality. For example, if I write on, uh, as a teacher and if a student who is in primary one who go to read reading, she or she will not understand because it's in my view, it's my reality. So what kind of view and reality are we talking about? So again, these are the questions that critical literacy would force the reader to question and answer. 
because um, I think it is something which is much neglected, as I said, because the learning of language might be moving towards a more structural and technical direction. Interrogating the writer, uh, of course, um, the author is dead. There's no way you can ask the author, why did you write that? It is actually more for us as a reader to interpret, to know what is going on and why the writer wrote it like that, and multiple meanings. This is actually, uh, I find it especially interesting for poetry, because poetry is something which is so abstract and subjective, and so it's really a different interpretation which I find very interesting when we talk about critical literacy and try to understand the issues. Uh, okay. That is the question that teachers should ask, the questioning techniques for Malay language classroom teaching. Okay, um, this is about the same thing. I would say that there's an opportunity to critique. Um, and students always ask me, but we don't take literature, why must we critique? We are just learning Malay language. So I would say that it is not based on subject. So you can see the mentality of students nowadays. If I'm learning geography, there's no way you should ask me about history. Or if I'm learning Malay language, how is it possible we're discussing politics? How does Chekhu know about politics? How does Chekhu know about what's going on in Southeast Asia? I thought you make making parts every day, you know? So it's a kind of mentality that is um, destructive for the language because we are not giving opportunities to ourselves and students to critic and learn more about what is going on. And it challenges the idea that meaning is fixed because that is also a challenge because as a staff of MOE, we do want meaning to be fixed because it's easier and it's also structured. But structure, we come structure comes also um, the rigidness of the language and that's also um, difficult because I would find students nowadays, they would think in boxes and it's difficult for them to break out of this box and try to be more critical. Okay, uh, I'm using two poems today because uh, I think poetry is easier to discuss uh, as compared to perhaps poses or short stories. Um, I chose two poems by our local writers, by Juga by the late Masri SN and take up by Chakulati. Right? So even 